Okay. The poem is Jungle Child or a Lump of Wax, a Wad of Cotton. In a corner of a museum, finally I meet your face, Jungle Child extinct, a lump of wax, a wad of cotton. Now you stand among hills, <coughs> rivers, trees and birds, stiff and dry. You stand in a corner of a museum, finally, and closed in glass, jungle child, suffocated and alone. A river? Two? Well, this is about the river that flows uninhibited to the ocean. This river questioned, never questions its source. It surges too blindly towards the sea, flows fiercely through mountain waterfalls, shrieks sadly when drowned by rain. In level valleys, its current slowly crawls, but whispers of rose-scented dreams Uncertain if it wants to mix with the sea because its soul is fresh and its bod body covered with mud. Isn't that beautiful? Yes. Malay poetry, modern Malay poetry. So, this is my experiences from. Okay, this is. I attended uh, Konkan University. It's a very important university because it's the University of Isan. You know that. A very progressive university. They have a Mekong division. Konken. 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 And also, the, I also attended the other, another university, Kossetsart, agri for agriculture. Both are about the future of agriculture in Thailand. So they took us to this enormous uh, 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 a place where villagers have taken their fate into their own hands because they were suppressed by ag agribis agrobusiness. Agrobusiness came to them and said, Wow, what, what, are, are you earning a lot of money here from the, the, these uh, vegetables you're growing and fruit? You can earn a lot more. We'll, we'll loan you some money. And you can plant palm oil. Should we do that, you know? No, no risk at all. You plant palm oil, you get the money from us, and you will get dividends very rapidly. So they did, resulting in no more diversified agriculture. The children buying food in the store instead of cultivating it, okay, on the market. And then not having money to do that, the children got, got undernourished, 40% undernourished children at that place. And then palm oil prices got down, they couldn't pay their loans, their farms were taken over by, agri by agribusiness. They became slaves on their own farms, working as day workers on their own farms. That is what happening with agriculture. So, some of them got together, more got together, they all got together and said, we will do something about this. And finally, miraculously, it happened in northern, northeastern Thailand. So I came up there. The group is called Inpang. The, they f founded a community network in 1987, embracing a new concept of economy, the sufficiency economy of his mass, 
His Majesty the King, you know, sufficiency economy principle. Transforming a number of fields into diverse agroforestry systems. So they gradually expanded into a large network of farmer groups in villages. A big network in five provinces of northeastern Thailand. Self-reliant, promoting sustainable development and develop local enterprises for village employment and income, income sources. When I came up there, they told me about the, uh, what was the basis. Um, how to live within the capitalist system in a globalist world, but how to change their own ways of thinking and practice. They told me, let me see, I can start here. Well, The, it's a community-led chain of eco-valid villages based on self-reliance. Uh, a cooperative, making a cooperative banking system, organic farming, independent of government support, bringing the uh, forest back into the villages, and then um, finding new products, producing new products from these forests, making herbal medicine, all based on indigenous knowledge. Um, they uh, revive their own, their own festivals and rituals connected to the um, autumn, spring, summer, and so on, and have a whole month for spiritual activities, November month. Um, so, they found out we have lost a whole generation that that um, immigrated that migrated we have lost our forest and they asked themselves how can we how can we change our way of 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 of, of uh, living so they, I mean, it all started with a series of meetings where they asked, what potential do we have? Self-analysis, self-criticism. They did not want to start with the problem. They wanted to start with possibilities. What potential has every one of us? So they asked themselves, what are the human resources we, we have? What are the natural resources we have? What are the knowledge resources we have? How can we, how can we come back to, uh, to the, the indigenous knowledge? How can, we, how can we live by indigenous knowledge? And then, what about, what about healthcare? Um, uh, 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 making an, their own radio with uh, um, health, inform health information. What about uh, uh, what about um, uh, schooling? Making their own school and then making their own university, Life University, L I F E, Learning Institute for Everyone. Life Learning Center, sending which could form the basis for their youth, sending them to university, uh, financing their 
schooling on the condition that they come back into the village. Now, for the, they have their own production of, of, of forestry products, their own processing, their own marketing, and 20% of what they earn goes back into the well, community welfare, co producing their own biofertilizer, using no chemicals, living ecologically, and so on. I was so impressed by, by, by this marvelous new beginning in, um, in the agriculture of, of, of Thailand. Community ownership of production facilities working to empower local communities. Yes, the, have, uh, making their own banking. So, that is my experience of a new beginning for urban Thailand. And I was so inspired. You can go there if you like. You go to Mekong, the, the Inpang, uh, Inpang community. Can you spell that, Jess? Inpang community. Can you spell? I-N-P-A-N-G. It is in five provinces of northeastern Thailand. Inpang? Inpang. Inpang, yes. It's Sakonakon, Udantani, Kalasin. Mukta Harn and Nokon Panom. And here is a, a, a chart of that. That was, I just wanted to share with you, and I think some of you also have experiences of how to start a new beginning in, 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 in your rural areas. Yes. I think we have the Amazon experience Please, also. Okay. Uh, I have yeah. a, a question of how we continue now, technically. Uh, because if we record and you are, have now the microphones there on you, um, and if now Mariana uh, asks you a question, they will not understand. So we have to find a way, <coughs> the air conditioning is very loud, so we would have to find a way to make that um, in a way uh, presentable on the video. Um, so you could pass your mic. Yeah, perhaps if the person who is making a comment is putting herself... Yeah. Uh, no, 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 not on your feet, sit. But uh, perhaps like that, it would work. And you could use your microphone. Like, you come here and you use this microphone. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, was uh, uh, what you were describing is what we observed yesterday with this agro business. Yes. And um, thank you to your presentation. I had the language to describe it because I didn't know. You know, like, it's amazing. Thank you for that. Then uh, my second question, now my question is, <coughs> did you write a paper about this? What? Did you write a paper about this? No, I, I, no, I have not yet. But I have, I have um, my, um, oh yes. No, but we should ha make more, uh, we, we should try to cooperate with Konken University so that I, I don't know if there is any anything written about it yet but I hope Konken University would uh, would uh, give us a chance to uh, have a, make a project of that and to communicate that exactly exactly because um, yesterday at the we already were thinking about how we can do this and that. 
and we could just kill you know, share with us. We don't need to repay the meal. And specifically uh, in Thailand, and if somebody working there, then it's very important to have that knowledge in order to move forward with other projects, whatever these projects are. And just I wanted to thank you for your work. I'd like to publish on that with you. And you haven't done a paper yet. I'd certainly like to put some of that research with my thesis, if that's okay. Because you are in forestry. I'm in forestry. And this is a reforestation project, bringing the forest right, not only right into the villages, but finding new products from, from, from the trees. And I'm also interested, you said it's from indigenous knowledge. Yes. So I'd be interested to know a couple of things more, lots more about it. The two particular things, is it particular groups? Which indigenous groups are they? And where did the initiative come from? Where did the ideas come from doing this? Uh, uh, all, well, I think uh, uh, it, it just came from a small group that were, were hit by, hard hit by agribusiness and said, we must start something. And then this, it grows into a movement, and they did it. Yeah. That's great. I mean, are they, are they Lao people, or are they uh, Hmong people, or...? No, they are not tribal people in that. In that they, they are the people living on the border. Yeah? And, uh, yes, the, the, the agriculturalists, okay. farmers. Isan farmers. Yeah. Isan farmers. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm a Thai. I like to share you a little bit about the Sakchen economy scheme. Uh, I went to Sakchen Sao province like 10 years ago and we went to a, a, a home of a headman who, grow, who grows everything. Uh, like diversity, diversity uh, and uh, he could uh, make herbal uh, medicine and uh, you know a anything from plant and he he teaches others and there are several of these people in Thailand we call them like uh, in, uh, local wisdoms so they were like a movement of uh, sustainable development growing your own food and then you share the surplus or you barter Mm -hmm. And then when, when it's be beyond your, your own consumption, then you can sell. So that was like the sufficient economy scheme is like you have a plot of land, uh, one right or something. One right is like uh, 16,000 square meters. You have uh, a paddy field, you have pond, a pond, and you have uh, chicken. And then you grow fruit trees, you grow rice in your own field, and that would sustain you. And that only can be done in a tropical area like Thailand, right, because you have sunshine all year round. And then you could actually live on your own farm, eat what you plant, vegetables and uh, fruit and so on. And you can buy very little f outside uh, of your house. So this way, uh, a, uh, a teacher in Chiang Rai once put it this way: we don't be, we don't need to be uh, slave of the Western, uh, the, of the Western yeah, capitalist. So he he's a teacher. I would interview him. He was a teacher, uh, teaching Thai language or arts. But he has a, a plot of land and he grows uh, fruit trees. And he said he could pick the, the fruit all year round. He has his own paddy field. He said, I'm a teacher. I'm not afraid of being a farmer. So I know how to farm. So he has rice. And he bought, he buys very little from the, from the market. That, that's what I know. And it has been going on for a decade, at least, by now. And I'm not surprised to hear what's going on in Isan. I'm, I'm very happy to hear that it works. And it really works. 
Yes. And uh, that people won't have to leave the, the village to become a tuk-tuk driver or taxi driver and become a slum dwellers in, in Bangkok. Thank you. It's really nice to know that uh, I mean, this types of work is going on in uh, Thailand. Uh, it's really impressed me uh, because uh, when I looked at my delays in Bangladesh, uh, I found uh, there are many people, old people, they passed away and they knew a lot of things, how to do the cultivations and how to do the fishing and a lot of experience, local experiences. But uh, now their sons and grandsons, they just don't know how to do this works because uh, they are uh, uh, engaged with the so-called modernization and they turn into the modern businesses. So it sometimes makes problem for them. Uh, they, they lost their, I mean, uh, you, uh, I mean uh, you can make the medicine from the, well, so harbor medicine from the different things, uh, different uh, trees or different leaves. Uh, they forget it, uh, they cannot do it now. So I, uh, these things actually encourage me when I go to the village, I will encourage uh, my people uh, in local area uh, to do these things. Yes, you should turn back and you should get some things from the order uh, who, if the person with it, uh, might not be, I mean, you might not be working anymore in here. I'm sharing a very uh, sad story about Bangladesh. Uh, in uh, 1947, uh, when uh, British left uh, 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 the country, there was a very uh, uh, painful story. Bangladesh uh, used to produce the so Muslim uh, clothes, Muslim clothes. It's a very expensive and it's sold in the European market and it keep it in uh, one small tiny cigarette packet like five pieces of the big clothes. Like, um, uh, I mean, first of all, women can wear uh, the shari, shari is called most in China is very famous. But you know what happened is painful story. When people lady they cut the finger of the I mean who used to swing the I mean verse called uh, claws, they cut the thumb uh, the, so they cannot uh, make any more uh, this uh, thumb. So the, the, the next generation they couldn't um, uh, I mean rescue uh, these types of claws anymore. So this painful story happened uh, sometimes in uh, in the past. So this is not anymore. Uh, this mostly not producing in Bangladesh. Uh, so this modernization sometimes actually uh, take uh, away some things that we lose and that we will not recover anymore. So we have to look our past, and our root is actually villages. Our root is, is actually forest. So we have to take some things from the forest, from the nature. And you say some things like, like is learning from? Yeah, that's their, their, their university. Yes, learning from the information. Life. Life is learning from the environment. It's, it's the life, L-I-F-E. Yes. What is this? Learning called? Institute for Everyone. A learning Institute for Everyone. This is so nice. I love it. Uh, uh, so, uh, we have to learn something from India. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, you know, Bangladesh is a country that introduced microloans. Yes. Yes. And this is what happens in ESA now, too. The own banking system giving microloans, it makes a, makes a big difference yes. in that village. Okay, should I share something about the microloans? Yes. yes, yes, this is actually great man. I introduced uh, Professor Dr. Yunus. I go uh, back in uh, not to the all over the world actually respect him. Uh, he introduced the micro credit. Actually, you know the bank is giving credit to those people who have money. And they are giving the money to those people who does not have money, who does not have any house, who, who is begging door to door. They're giving money and this money can be used for uh, to develop uh, their life. And this is actually really, really an wonderful project. And with this project, some other organization, they introduce different projects. And especially there are Muslim community. Uh, this Muslim community introduced, I will discuss in my, uh, I mean, uh, what is called in my presentation. Uh, like uh, Muslim community, they started a uh, charity program. Like they have annual charity like Jaga. So through Jaga, they keep the uh, charity like credit to the people. And you know, in microcredit, you have to beg the 
money, but for charity, they will monitor that where you are using this money and they will train, yeah, not eating the fish and every day, yes, you to teach how to do the fishing. So give them money and train them and you have to work them and you need not back that money again. If you are self solvent, then if you think, yeah, I can pay, I can help with other people, then you can volunteer do the same things. But you are not bound to pay back this money uh, to the who, who, who serve you. This is an honor for Uzit by running by the um, Islamic Bank Bangladesh Limited. This they are doing very well. Uh, and but microcredit is very famous uh, all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so 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 much. This is so fascinating. Um, my last book, the, the title is A Dignity Economy. And whoever wishes to have it, I send it as a PDF file to everybody. And when I was learning more about this, um, you know, preparing for the book, I was trying to learn as much as possible. And um, I just would like to invite you to, to know that there is a lot of criticism of micro lending also, and it has been abused uh, in, in very um, hideous ways, um, so that one has to be very, very careful with uh, looking at what kind of micro -lending. It is also some kind of shark micro around. Big banks have de detected it, they have detected that poor people are very good in paying back, and they put very high interest, and it's a kind of Losing of their resources, uh, as if there is a new uh, area of resource that can be looted or squeezed. Um, the other thing is, you know, what do we want? Do we really want to in invite everybody on this planet to be part of a system where you have a livelihood only if you sell some something? to a customer, a service or a product. Uh, if you think through that, basically this is an unsus from my research, it's an unsustainable uh, concept. Uh, first, you know, we have uh, we, uh, an example. We have the world full of people who produce things, that produce cheap gadgets because they need a uh, livelihood and they, they need customers. So we, at the moment, we um, kind of burn the resources of our planet to make products. Like, we don't want to help a person only to fish, but to do the fishing. The fishing will destroy our planet. If we teach everybody on this planet how to fish, we will not have a planet anymore. We, this is too short a perspective. Uh, at the moment, we are making too many products that have perhaps no customers. And we, the, the people's livelihoods, we make them dependent on selling a product or a service. And this, to my research, what my research showed, with, you know, I'm not alone, there's a huge group of people around the world. And as you know, I live globally and I meet them everywhere. The entire system must be thought wider. Like, if we say we cannot just give fish to a person, we need to teach the person, person how to fish. The next social entrepreneur level from the United States says, no, it's not enough. We need to reform the fishing industry, make it more effective. But even that is not enough, because if we make the fishing industry more effective, as we see, the ocean will be fished empty. So the entire approach is going into the wrong direction. So we have to widen our scope and say, it's not enough to simply make the fishing industry more effective. We have to make our entire thinking more appropriate to a, a planet that is finite in resources. All these attempts at the moment are part of, of a, a global system that attempts to squeeze wherever resources are to be found, social and ecological resources. The, the system is defined so that these resources are being squeezed more and then you know, extracted. 
and exploit it. So what our task is, is to not just give fish, not just teach fishing, not just reform the fishing industry. Mm. No, we have to think through the entire global system in which we live. And at the moment, I'm uh, writing a book together with a philosopher of social science. His name is Howard Richard. Richards. He is a dissident from the United States. He has taught in the United States and is, uh, he left the United States as a dissident to Chile already 40 years ago. And uh, he's working a lot in South Africa. So we spent uh, six weeks together last year with the professor Catherine Odora Hoppers who made this crocodile image that I showed on the first day. So we three, we stayed together for six weeks and we write a book about Michel Foucault, the philosopher Michel Foucault and his concept of knowledge, how knowledge and power is connected and how indigenous knowledge systems, since they are not supported and validated by power, are lost. What is it? Oh yes, you have the video with Howard Richards there on on uh, on the uh, YouTube. That's I uploaded all the videos we made last year in South Africa. Um, so uh, and his his analysis after thinking through this for 40 years, he says we have to be careful to um, we have to move away from thinking that teaching people, training people to make products or to give services, that this would solve our problems. It will not. Uh, and he says, if you look back, we we'll have to change, and also Catherine Odora Hoppers would say, we have to, it's not enough with re reforming reg regulatory um, rules. We have to reform the constitutive rules that define our system and that define what uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein calls the world system, IMF, World Bank, everything is now structured according to one system. And if you look at where does this system come from, Howard Richards ha has uh, researched that for 40 years and he says it's, we have to go back 2,000 years. Today, the entire world system is defined according successes of L Roman law. At some points, there were more systems like Chinese, Islam. At the moment, the world system is, has been taken over by successes of Roman law that started more, uh, some, but more than 2,000 years ago. And uh, their ground pillars, we have to think through that. And this is what he uh, teaches in his work. So I just want to bring your attention to that tinkering within a system that is unsustainable, that is not functioning, tinkering within it. I think in this moment of our history as a human uh, uh, species on our, history, on our planet, it's too little. We have to think much, much larger and we have to change the, the basic pillars of our global system. putting 20% of uh, the income that's generated uh, back into the community yes. uh, is a very good example of a different system of, uh, of, of people helping themselves, uh, working together uh, to create a better community. And I want to ask you a question. You said that, uh, before, before I make my comment, uh, I want to ask you, you said that this uh, community network was founded in 1987 Yes. And since then, it's spread to five provinces in the Isan yes. area, is that right? So how many farm families are involved in this? Well, I mean, uh, th this is quite old. This here says 50 villages and 4,000 households. It, it, I think there may be more. Okay, well, no, that's very encouraging, very encouraging. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, uh, Destruction of family farming uh, is a worldwide phenomenon, uh, particularly since the end of World War II. Yeah, this is a year for family, UN year for family farming. Yes, it's a very 2014. Good. It's about time. 
Uh, and, um, and so if, if we look at, I mean, I'm, I, I did my, uh, actually I did some research on the uh, organic farming movement in Japan. And there, uh, it wasn't farming, farmer initiated, uh, it was consumer initiated. It was back in 1972 uh, when the consumers uh, who had read uh, Rachel Carson's uh, Silent Spring and had been uh, another Japanese woman, Ariyo, she wrote uh, 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 Compound Pollution, uh, were influenced by the fact that you know, they're saying that uh, it's not just destroying the environment, it's destroying our health. Yeah. Um, and we have to get away from this type of, not just unsustainable agriculture, but poisonous agriculture. It's yeah. poisoning uh, the whole system. Um, and, uh, and, of, and of course, what happened in Japan was that uh, ag was always in, in the interest of agribusiness. Um, uh, Japanese farmers were encouraged to buy machinery, buy pesticides, buy fertilizers, buy cash crops, go into debt, uh, and, and this is what happened. They lost their land. Many of them, uh, by in, 19, in 1955, there were about 6.4 million farm families. By 1995, there, there were less than 3 million. So uh, farmers couldn't survive by farming. And uh, so in 1972, there was a start of uh, what in, in Japan is called the Teikei Movement. It's a, uh, it's a co-partnership. Uh, co uh, and in Europe and the United States, uh, they, they took the Japan model and uh, they, they called it community-supported agriculture. So uh, consumer groups uh, would, would go to farmers and, and encourage them, if, if they would switch over to organic farming techniques, then the consumer groups would buy their organic produce in a direct marketing relationship. Uh, they would guarantee that they would buy these products, and um, uh, and so th this was a kind of a re revitalization of, uh, of uh, uh, family farming in Japan. And uh, the DK movement has uh, grown tremendously. In Japan, uh, Japan has a very, very large organic farming movement, but still, it's 90% 90, 90 of the remaining farmers are part-time farmers. The only full-time farmers are, are, are the organic farmers. Hmm. So here in Thailand, uh, you know, you're talking about uh, five provinces and uh, did you say 50,000 yes, 50, families? Uh, uh, this was before. Uh, four, uh, 50 villages. 4,000 households, 50 villages. And this was... Uh, and, and this uh, is a long time ago, ago. so it's so much it's bigger growing. now, I think. It yes. is, hopefully it's growing. And I'm wondering, uh, another question that came up, uh, were these far did these farmers still own the land? They still own the land, and that's how they were able to convert to organic. Well, uh, I didn't, I did, I didn't ask this problem, but I know they changed to organic farming. That was their, that was their principle. Yes. Oh. Most of them own land. Oh, okay. So yes. the king gave some to like. Were the king who supported. Who, yeah, yes. the, some people. It's a cooperative. Yeah, some people got the land. This is very encouraging, and uh, certainly uh, more yes. and more uh, information should be uh, provided to the outside yes. world about this and to the rest of the uh, farmers in Thailand as well. I'm yes. very in, happy to hear about that. Yes, I should, maybe I should add the King's initiatives yeah. of the King's farms that are here in Lana, and you know about these, the, the, the royal projects uh -huh. are also into some kind of this kind of thinking of sufficiency economy because the king himself is, 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 is a very important person in promoting a new kind of economy, the it's sufficiency economy. Yeah, I'd like to give uh, credit to this king, King Rama the Ninth or King Kumipon yes. uh, the Great. He started it, uh, this idea like 40 years ago. He talked about sufficient economy while everyone was craving about uh, neoliberalism. And uh, yeah, he, that was, uh, be, uh, people became to realize how important it is when we sank into the devaluation of the bar, our currency in 1997. So people started to think about, you know, sufficient economy, how to live, uh, how to be self-reliant and autonomy and so on. But the, the, the king started from in his own palace. He, uh, he, he has paddy fields in his own palace. He has uh, cows and so on. And he started 
that at uh, in Chiang Mai, and he went to Chiang Rai, converted the hill tribes who grew at that time uh, opium into uh, strawberry fields, and at that time, a lot of people laughed at this project because it's ridiculous. Opium makes a lot of money, and how much a strawberry, uh, you know, a kilogram of stra uh, strawberries co will cost. But then, but later on, it became very successful, so he had kind of doi cam project, uh, organic uh, farm, and you know, grow all kind of vegetables that normally you would have to eat import from abroad. So, and uh, the, the, the scheme of sufficient economy has spread it a lot in, into the rural community, but some can do, some can do, I, I don't know about the detail, but there are a lot of people who form network, like Kuyai Vibun Khen Chalom, the headman of Cha Cheng Sao that I talked about, and uh, the people who were like the starting uh, core uh, leadership of uh, training the others, so they were like farmers who exchanged their knowledge and and uh, teach. Uh, they teach uh, the other from other uh, other uh, villages. And I would like to emphasize as one uh, English guy who speaks Thai and is married to a Thai, and he's a farmer now. He uh, got his education from from uh, England, a uh, bachelor of something, a uh, very high eyebrow university, but he became a farmer in Thailand and he, he got uh, his uh, respect from the people and he's, he helps uh, teaching people how to grow organic uh, farming. And he's in Isan, mm. uh, in one of those provinces. Yeah, and he's, he's one of the trainer, uh, trainers of uh, this project, yeah. Yes. His name is Mark, Martin, Martin Wheeler. I see. Yeah. So if I understood you correctly, the king, uh, under the king's initiative, promoted and encouraged organic farming? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. But, uh, you know, it's like yesterday when we went uh, to, a, to a rural village, uh, we saw a lot of uh, uh, flowers being grown with a huge amount of pesticides. Uh, what happened to that project? Uh, is, is King no longer involved in promoting uh, is and it encouraging? Is uh, project? Is yeah. It is, project? Is, that, is that involved uh, uh, in the cash crop production of I flowers? I don't know about, uh, but I know that the King's... Uh, I, 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 I know that there are a lot of uh, uh, pesticides uh, being used uh, in this area, especially the hill tribes, and we all are aware of, of, of that, that we know that the people who grow them die of, of the intoxication. And, uh, but I don't know, I don't have any idea that the Royal Project would use a lot of uh, pesticides though. Um, I mean, uh, the, the Royal Project is situated, you can go to Mon Tem here in Chiang Mai, it's on the hill where they show you how to grow organic farming and they have a restaurant there, up there, and you can taste the food there. And there's Doi Kam project, which is on Doi Kam, and they grow things. So you can go to see any royal projects, but not anywhere on the hill. This is not royal, so it's like the people who, who do it, and, and then they burn a lot of, of you, you can see that Chiang Mai is full of uh, dust that people burn, anything, trash or their field or whatever. So that now is a kind of campaign not to burn, uh, to preserve your lovely Chiang Mai is in a local dialect. And it, they burn less this year, but in Lampang they burn a lot because Lampang is like a walk. And it, it, it would stay there. And a lot of people had a problem with their breathing, uh, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, system. So, uh, you, 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 you can't say, you know, when, when people use a lot of pesticides and that's a king project. The king, I think the king, he, he would emphasize on uh, organic farming and the, uh, we know that all veggies and fruit uh, from, from the king's project are okay, uh, good for cons consumption. And you know that in Chiang Mai, there are a lot of organic restaurants, organic, uh, those restaurants also own their own either paddy fields or, or uh, farms, 
and you can they serve uh, uh, veggies fresh from the, the farm. So it's here a, a bigger movement here in Chiang Mai where you can't find many in, in Bangkok. Yeah. I just would like to ask the permaculture. Is this something that has been done? Permaculture? No. What is permaculture? Okay, then. Yes. Permaculture. Do you see it in the markets? No, I don't know. Yes. So see it in some of the markets. Okay. Permaculture? Okay. Permaculture is a, a very comprehensive approach to agriculture, where it's not just the organic growing of one crop, but it's the viewing of a farm as an entity, for example, because sometimes... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what yeah. I know. Okay. That's what I, I talk about, the Puyai people, the headman who grow. Um, actually, uh, you know that Thailand is... Uh, has We have... Uh, our forest is not like in European uh, forest that you have only one type of, of crops. We are kind of multi-million biodiverse uh, plants and uh, each plants rely on each other. So that's how the villagers live. They get the mushroom, they got the bamboo shoots, they get a lot of things from the forest. And then there was a little uh, yeah, medicine, there was a herbal plant where the, those uh, people who try to get in, involved and get the seeds or get the uh, pattern on our di diversification. But then the new, that, that's what you call the herd, the new that I heard? Permaculture. Permaculture. That started long, long ago by that headman in Chachen Sao province close to Bangkok. He, he grows everything in his land and he doesn't use pesticides. Just the same as the Japanese Fu, uh, Ma, Ma, uh, Maobu Fu, Fu Osuko or something. Masonobu Fu, yeah. That, then he doesn't use pesticides. So he has, a lot of things doesn't have to be neat and tidy and uh, whatever, so it grows and then you know that each, each tree relies on the other trees and he has medicines a lot, a lot here. Yeah, you know, tropical uh, forests that you don't need to have only bamboos or only eucalyptus and you know that what happened in Isan, that they, they were advertised or they were convinced that the monocrops would yield, yeah. uh, uh, you know, for, for uh, you know, money, cash crops, and that kind of stuff. And you learn it that the uh, that makes the soil uh, bad or uh, erosion and so on. And the king even even invented a kind of uh, glass that would stop erosion of the soil. So he does a lot of he has done a lot of of things until he's now 86 years old. And no wonder why people love him for for what he he he, he has done. I'm just going to relay an answer to Daryl because about uh, the Royal Project, which I learned uh, and on this visit, I learned I learned that um, th through the the land was rented out to other businesses, and so it is not the responsibility of the king, but these businesses are allowed to do many things, many bad things, so that uh, that's why you couldn't get an answer like, does the king know this? But it is legal in that sense. But it would be good if there were more regulations about what can they do with the land. Mm -hmm. uh, I just wanted to come back a little, a little bit on that, but also something Eden said earlier. And that's to me that I have kind of a, maybe it's a personal developed categorization, maybe other people share it. But when I look at learning and what people learn, that I say first of all comes the knowledge. That's the facts, the basics. And then you want to know how to apply it. So you get the know-how. So first is the knowledge, then there's the know-how. But that's not enough. You still need the third thing, which is the wisdom. And the wisdom is whether you apply it, and which technique you apply at this time, or whether you don't apply it, or whether it's the right thing to do. And I think that's something that we are missing a lot of times with the market philosophy when you talked about giving people the ability to fish. They've got the know-how to fish now, or how to make a product or a service. They've got the know-how to make that product or service, but they haven't got the wisdom about whether it's appropriate or not appropriate. And that can be for lots of reasons. It can be because they're chained into the system as a whole. It can be lack of uh, capacity. Uh, there's lots of aspects. So that's something interesting for me is 
where does the wisdom come from? And I think that that's what's so refreshing about this project we hear here with the villages. They're linking up and creating, in a way, an emergent property, which is beyond the individuals that are making a business or beyond the individual saving money. They're making a bank. That's emergent. They're moving and working together. And that working in concert is creating something new they couldn't do on their own. Uh, and that's really exciting if that can be scaled, if that can be replicated, not just in other places in Thailand, but it provides a really good counter alternative um, to the dominant paradigm of everybody going to the cities to develop. Their, their university that's based in the village, I think that's, that's wonderful. Now at the moment they have to go out of the village to get the education. We've had this question in the West. For example, in Wales, there's about two and a half million people there. And officially, Welsh and English are equal languages. When it comes to third level education, to university level education, you cannot get Welsh language education. And then the academic world is very against the idea of the course being extended into the Welsh language, the indigenous language, that is spoken and used in all other aspects of society. So for me, if the village starts to do this, to create its own village culture, there's a chance to bring that education in that language, in that culture, and that way of seeing the world. So I think that's the wisdom that I would like to see happen more and replicated in more places, which provides a real alternative to one globalised, connected world to lots of small worlds in a, in a matrix. Thank you. What uh, I think... Uh, Evelyn, we have to talk, we have to see the large picture. We are all in that uh, gap of the allig alligator. And I think this is a beginning. What we see now in Thailand is a, is, is a beginning that must, be, must spread. I think in the 60s and 70s, I was connected to a movement in, in, in Norway where we, where we were promoting um, ecological accountancy. And there were, there were a lot of, uh, that time, villages that were willing to try, to try these new principles of, 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 of thinking, income and outcome. That, that means, you, that means to know what are our human resources how can we replenish these resources how can what are our natural resources how much do we give up give out and how much can we replen can 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 uh, can we can come back to us and at last of this knowledge resources what what are the intellectual and knowledge resources of our village and how how can we preserve and how can we utilize it in this present situation we need it so much It would be good to have our representative from Thailand to present 
both these things. What yes. the, ki the the king's uh, the king's role today and 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 and, and the, the change in attitude of farmers, the change in from being subservient to the capitalist economy and to uh, and to and to take matters into their own hands for the betterment of the whole uh, of, of society. The king's role is Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. So you uh, thank you very much.